So let's a big round of applause for our deliverance band, Freddie and Nancy. Thank you. Woo. <clears throat> now, if only, if only Ray and I can get our stuff uh, working as well as they just did, right? Getting our demos working right now. Because what we're going to do is a complete live demo presentation. We're going to hack together some things. We're going to deploy some, deploy some things. We got all of these Kubernetes clusters, all this infrastructure we got deployed for you. We're even going to let you play our game at some point if you could pay attention. At this point, let me get started. My name is Burr Sutter, but first, let's introduce Ray. Ray. Hello, I'm Ray. I'm a Java champion. I'm also a developer advocate for Google Cloud Platform. Oh, 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 I'm also a Java champion, and I'm a developer advocate, but for Red Hat. Okay. And I was born in Taiwan, and I moved to California when I was 12, and now I live in New York. Actually, I live in Hoboken, New Jersey, but it's pretty close. Um, how many people here are from New York or from the North? All right, go Yankees. Woo! All right, right. woohoo. Okay, well, I, in my case, I was born in Hawaii, but I grew up in Alabama. I know, go figure, right? And I spent my first 20 years of my career here in Georgia. So how many Southerners do we have here in the room? Oh, wow. Oh, I think I got an advantage. I got an advantage. I got my Southerners here. Yeah, well, that's, that's okay. pretty cool. And um, so I'm from Google, and um, Google created Kubernetes uh, back in 2014. And since then, it's been donated to CNCF. And then we've been working a lot with the community and delivering, uh, creating new open source projects, uh, stuff like uh, Eastio, the service mesh, and Kennedy, the service platform. And today on my demo, I'm going to be using Kubernetes Engine on Google Cloud Platform, but you can also run uh, Kubernetes on-prem uh, with our Anthos uh, platform as well. Okay, okay, well, I, in my case, with Red Hat, we also started with the open source project right behind Google. We joined the Google project for Kubernetes back in 2014, and we actually delivered OpenShift, which is our distribution of Kubernetes, to the market at large for supported customers back in 2015. And we are still the largest provider of on-premises Kubernetes for the market at large. So in my case, I actually have OpenShift running on Amazon, Google, and Azure. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, very cool. Okay. So we've got okay. a lot to show you today. All right. Okay. Yeah. So at this point, though, I think we want to see exactly what's going on, Ray. You can show us how we build Java microservices for this new architecture. Right. So what we're going to do is to create a backend for our um, game, um, for the game, and specifically for the configuration. And uh, we're going to create a RESTful service here. And uh, my, favorite, uh, my favorite framework is actually Spring, Spring Boot. Now, how many people here use Spring Boot? All right. Woo! Just about the whole room. Look at that. So, wow. So I'm going to be a good Spring Boot citizen. I'm going to go to startup Spring.io and go to the Spring Initializer. And of course, we can go ahead and add the web starter there. But the, one of the things that Google has been doing behind the scenes also is to create this project called Spring Cloud GCP. So if you actually use Spring Boot on Google Cloud Platform, uh, we work pretty closely with the, the Spring engineers, and uh, we try to make an idiomatic, idiomatic experience for you to be able to connect to our services behind the scenes uh, using idiomatic Spring Boot. Uh, stuff. So, for example, we have data repositories for Spanner and Data Store and many, many other things. And the easiest way to get to that is by adding the GCP support from the initializer, and that's pretty much it. And of course, you can go ahead and generate this project. Now, I already have a template here open up that's been generated from the same, um, the same configuration. And um, I can go ahead and create a new RESTful service here uh, that's going to return the configuration for this game. So what I'm going to do is to say, I'm going to say this is a class for the config controller, right? And uh, this is a REST controller. Everyone kind of knows this already. And uh, I'm going to use a get mapping, and I'm going to map this to the slash config endpoint. And it's going to produce JSON, so I'm going to make the media type, media type here, with the application JSON value. And I'm going to go ahead and return the configuration here with the little handler. I'm going to say config, oh, config C, not config C, well, right here. And I'm going to return the config. Now, I have uh, something templated already, and this is a game configuration. And uh, what this is going to do is to return you some points. So these are the scores that's going to, uh, that you're going to be able to get based on the colors you're going to get. So red will be one point, and so on and so forth. Um, and let me just go ahead and start this Spring Boot application as well. So I'm going to come back here to my screen, and I'm going to say Spring Boot Run. And now, in my configuration, in the Palm, I also have something called the Dev Tool. Right? This is something really neat. So you can actually add, uh, modify your application on the fly, and uh, you should be able to see the changes being loaded. So my Spring Boot application right now I started up in just about 1.3 seconds, so that's pretty impressive. And in my configuration, though, I want to make a few changes here. So for these different colors, for the Golden Snitch number two, 
I'm going to make that 100 points rather than just one. Oh. Okay. And uh, for my configuration, I'm also going to turn the golden snitch number two to be true. Okay. And then uh, for the game ID, it's going to be me, so it's going to be Ray. I'm going to review this, and uh, we should be able to see that uh, this gets reloaded. And uh, once it gets reloaded, uh, there we go, it re reloaded very quickly. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and do a curl, localhost, uh, 8081, and uh, see the config endpoint. And there we go, we have the new configuration. Is that pretty cool, Freddy? Yeah. What do you think? Oh, man. All right, all right, OK. So building Java microservices with Spring Boot and IntelliJ, I get it. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. OK, all right, well, let me see what I can do if I can remember all those things real <laughs> quick. We're going to have some fun here. All right, so in my case, I have this thing called Quarkus. I'm going to show you there's all alternative ways to build Java-based microservices. Quarkus, of course, is going to be incredibly fast, incredibly small. Quark being a subatomic particle, and us being that coolest part of software, us software developers. So let's get started. Let's see what I forget here, Ray. I don't know. I'm going to give this a try. I'm going to hit Start Coding here and go into my little thing. So I'm going to just give this a package name. Com demo, and this is also my configuration service. Let's see if I, my fingers get warmed up here. Configuration service, and let me get it named correctly. I think I did that correctly. All right, fantastic. Generate that application. This, of course, gets me a project template, downloads it. I can open up that zip file, and I'm ready to go. But in this case, I already have it opened, and I have some of it pre-populated. So this is what that endpoint looks like. And the first thing you want to do is, first, I'm running Visual Studio Code, all right? So this is a free IDE provided to the world by Microsoft but actually Red Hat is a key contributor to the, to the Red Hat, uh, to the Visual Studio IDE, Visual Studio Code IDE, and we do the language support for Java. So this is my favorite IDE. I like it because it's free, it's open source, so I can use it in a very lightweight fashion. So that's, uh, that's actually very cool, but let me go check out this code editor now. And the first thing you do with your Quarkus app, when you get one downloaded and get started, you put it in what we call dev mode. So Maven Quarkus dev, and that puts it into development mode for live reload. And the idea is pretty straightforward. You just simply go into your browser, and you go to the right URL, and there's my uh, index.html being loaded right there from the project template. And I can say hello here. Let me type that in correctly. It says hello. And the code says hello. And here's the whole idea. You basically edit. So bonjour. I say that like bonjour. Save. Refresh. All right? Bonjour, edit, save, refresh. Edit, save, refresh, and now if I want to say something like, hey, y'all, right? Edit, save, refresh. Is that cool? Yeah. Now, for my Node.js people in the room, you're like, we've seen that already. But as Java people, this is kind of new stuff, right? Edit, save, refresh. <coughs> yeah. OK. So let me do this now. I need to go ahead and add all the configuration stuff you were doing. I also have a little uh, snippet here that I can add. And I'm, well, 100 points. I can make mine 100 points, too, all right? And uh, yep, I'll make this the burr config. And let me see, and I'll make this one true. Let's see if I got that configuration done here. Oh, I need to change this to the right media type so we can return it correctly. Bump, 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 bump. Application JSON. And uh, yep, let's return the config object. There we go. Whoop, didn't mean to click on that. And get here, da, 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 my config. Got that in there, and let's go make it config, config, config. All right, so just change that endpoint, and edit, save, and let's go see if we did it correctly. Config, all right, fantastic. All right, edit, save, refresh. I can kind of work all day in that model. But at this point, let's say that's my code. I want to come back to my command line now, and I'm going to run a Maven package, so you can kind of see that I also have this fat, it's not really a fat jar, though. It's more of a, a thin jar, a skinny jar, and because it doesn't actually have the entire world loaded into the single jar, and that's because it's more efficient not to have the entire world in a single jar for Docker purposes. And so my jar is 200k right there. Let me go and run it real quick. So java-jar, dun, 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 target, and that's configuration service, uh, latest, and runner, and run that real quick. OK, well, oh, I have my, let me go fix that. I have this other thing running on port 8080. That's obviously going to cause a problem, so let's run that real quick. All right, starts in 0 0.07 seconds, or 0 0.7 seconds. Curl local host, and 0.8080, and config. OK, all right, cool. So my business logic looks like it's about right. Obviously, this is a simple application. But you know, you guys will get the picture. But let me do one more thing. I want to show you one more thing here. Let's go Maven package p native, all right? Now, I'm going to explain what this is, and I'm going to pop this open real quick to show you. I'm using this thing called Grail VM, all right? 
And what we're doing right now at Quarkus, and what we've optimized for in this new container or Kubernetes native experience, what we want to show you is we can take Java code and compile it down to a native executable. But here's really what's happening behind the scenes. Think of all the history of the last 20 years of using Java for building any form of application. With Java, you would basically look at the class path, find all the jar files on the file system, load those jar files from the file system, scan those jar files for classes with annotations, take all those annotations, build a meta model, which uses a lot of memory in that case, and then when that meta model is established, then execute all the business logic services behind that application. That's what happens in a typical JVM world, right? Class path, scan the file system, load the jars, scan for annotations, build a meta model ready to run. What just happened in the few seconds you saw running right here was it did an optimization. It took a closed world view of that entire application, figured out what needed to be executed, and basically removed dead code elimination, everything it doesn't need. So at this point, I have nothing hardly left inside this little executable. And you can kind of see, let's go look at it real quick. It is 24 megabytes. That is everything I need to run my entire microservice uh, uh, right there. So let me see if I can get that to run real quick. Target, and then configuration service runner, and run it. And it starts in 0 0.014 seconds. <laughs> Woo. What do you think about that, Nancy? Is that awesome? Yeah, 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 all right, cool. All right, and so uh, the last thing, of course, I'll do as a developer, as I build my microservice, I get the thing built, I need to do a Docker build. We actually provide an out-of-the-box uh, Docker file, so we give you a Docker file with a default template. So let me see here, I'll just, and I'll just pick the JVM one to keep this straightforward, right? So there it is. So let me see if I can remember this correctly. Docker, and I need to do a Docker build. A ta uh, and we're gonna go to Quay.io, that's my repository, Quay.io and Burr Sutter, and configuration service, and this one is called QJVM, and latest tag, and then dash F, that's that file I mentioned earlier, main Docker, Docker JVM, there we go, and dot, I will build my Docker image. Man, I got all that typed correctly, that's fantastic. Okay, and then I can do a Docker push. You do a Docker build, you do a Docker push. That's what we do as developers, right? Docker build, Docker push, helps if you type. <laughs> Docker correctly, dun, dun, dun. and it'll push it up to my repository and ready for the world to use out to the public repo there. So what do you think, Ray? Is that pretty awesome? I did my Docker build, I got the yeah. whole thing built. Wow, that's pretty impressive. And uh, GraalVM is a really exciting thing as well, and uh, I'm very happy to see that. It's very exciting for the Java community. Yeah, so, but this Docker build and Docker push thing is a little bit uh, more complex, right? And it's a lot of things to type, and uh, you go back and forth. And what do you have to do when you need to repeat your application? You gotta redo the whole thing again. So let me show you something else that's pretty cool. So uh, coming back to my system here, uh, Google actually created the plugin called JIB. And this is a plugin where you can build your Docker containers uh, without actually writing a Docker file. A friend of mine, uh, Matt Rabel, who works at a security company called Okta, uh, he once said, friend don't let friends write authentication. I'm gonna say, friend don't let friends write Docker files. Oh first. man. Because Docker files are hard to write. It's easy to get started, but it's hard to get right. And uh, there's like a lot of best practices you have to apply. So rather than doing all of that, all I need to do is to add a little a plugin here. Oh, the wrong one here. Let me see. The GIM one is the one I want. There we go. And all I need to do is to add a little JIP plugin here. And this works in Maven and Gradle. And you just need to give it the target registry you want to deploy this to. And I'm going to be using GCR, which is the Google Container Registry for my container. Okay. So once you save this configuration, we can go ahead and rebuild. So I'm gonna say maven compile and jib column build, oh, build right here. And even without Docker running on your machine, we're going to analyze your Docker, uh, your build file, and we're going to automatically apply the best practices, and you can see this is already done. Oh, and, wow. And this is actually applying the best practices where we split your application into multiple Docker layers so that if you mo only modify your code, we only have to push out the changes for that small layer as opposed to the whole thing. Okay, yeah. so, and it's already pushed right up there. Yeah, it's already in the cloud and uh, it's ready to be to deployed. Yeah, was that pretty cool, Freddy? Mm, that is pretty awesome. Yeah, it was really, really fast. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> What we can do next then is to deploy this into my Kubernetes cluster. So I have one running in Google uh, Kubernetes engine, and that is right here, okay? And this is actually a regional cluster, so this is highly available, 
And the nodes are spread across to three different availability zones on Google Cloud right now. And I got two nodes each and six nodes in total, right? This is across multiple, uh, multiple availability zones. And there's nothing running in there right now. So what I'm going to do is to deploy the container I just created into my cluster. And one of the best way to do this is, of course, write a YAML file. And in this case, what we're going to do is to uh, show you a deployment here, with the, which is a, the deployment for my Spring Boot application. Now, it is actually good to write a YAML file in this case because you want to check in the declare the desired state, right? So that you can reapply the same configuration later. Once you check it in, then you can recreate the same application, the same architecture over and over again. Okay, so in this case, what we have is a configuration service here. And the thing I want you to notice here is the number of replicas. So I want to deploy two instances into my cluster. And I also want to deploy my container image here, right, right here, which is the configuration service uh, Spring Boot container I just created. And I can just go ahead and create it. I'm going to use kubectl apply. And this will send this configuration to the Kubernetes master node. And then it's going to go ahead and make this into a reality, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and say configuration, deployment, uh, Spring Boot YAML, and watch the visualization tool here on, on the top, right? So I'm going to do apply. And once Kubernetes received this declaration, it's going to start my container in my cluster, and very quickly, we got two instances up and running, okay? And one other thing you will notice is that these instances are running on different machines. So based on the last four letters here, we can see which machine they're running on, and they're spread across the multiple machines. And Another thing you're going to notice is that each one of these instances actually has an IP address. So you can connect to those IP addresses from within the cluster. However, these IP addresses are ephemeral. That means they will change over time, potentially, when the instances come and go. So what do we do in this case? When you have multiple backends you want to connect to, even if you're on-prem, well, we put in a load balancer. Load balancing is a built-in concept in Kubernetes, and it's actually called a Kubernetes service. So that's another YAML file that we can create right here. So we can declare this load balancer as a Kubernetes service. And each one of these services has different types. And this one is going to be internal only. So the type is cluster IP. And then we can declare the port that we want to listen on. So this is port 8080. And all we need to do, again, is to apply this. And Kubernetes will see this declaration. This is your desired state. And it's going to make that into a reality as well. So I'm going to go ahead and apply it. And very quickly, we should be able to see the loan balancer coming online, and this is the IP address for the loan balancer. But one last thing here is that we actually also automatically configure the DNS, so rather than connecting to the IP address directly, in the consumer, all you have to do is to say HTTP config service and port 8080, and then it will get resolved into the IP address, and then we can load balance the traffic for you behind the scenes. So what do you think about that, Bert? Wow. That's pretty cool. cool. Yeah, that is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah I like it. I, what do you guys think? Yeah? Yeah. OK, OK. Well, you, you've got busted out Kubernetes on us now. So all right, let me try my thing over here. So let me see what I got for you, OK? I got, you, that was awesome, by the way. I like it. I like it. I like it. But here's what I got. As I mentioned earlier, I have my OpenShift running on my three different clusters, OK, or three different clouds. So I have my Google Cloud over here, and my OpenShift running on the Google Cloud. I have my Amazon cloud, right? Amazon, you guys might know this console and you might hate or love this console, that's up to you. But I have OpenShift running on that, uh, on that cloud. I have my Azure running here and my OpenShift running there. So the experience of using Kubernetes is the same across all clouds, from bare metal on-premises to all the public clouds. That's kind of our philosophy here at Red Hat. So what I want to do is show you something kind of cool too. So let me, uh, I'm going to switch over here and I'm going to go into back into the editor, okay? so. I like the fact that you got the, the YAML thing, but you know, friends don't let friends edit YAML. <laughs> All right, so let's try this. Let me see, let's try this. Uh, all right, I have in here the uh, Quarkus integration right into Visual Studio Code. I can add an extension, and there's a lot of extensions built right in that you can see out for Quarkus, so what do you, what do you want to integrate? Pretty much everything's been integrated, and of course these extensions have been optimized for that small, subatomic, super fast world that we focus on. But one of the extensions, well, unfortunately we don't have a lot of time, one of the extensions is Kubernetes. So let me hit return here. That's gonna augment my POM XML, but like Quarkus does all this build time optimization to create these really small uh, executables. We also have a ability, when I, when I run Maven package here, 
to also generate all the, all the Kubernetes stuff that I may not want to mess around with so much. So if I come look at target now, there's a Kubernetes folder, and then there's the YAML. And then if we look right here, there's my image. Uh, and actually, oh, I made a mistake. So let me make sure I get my image correct in there. Quay, uh, I, oh, there we go. But I have my image, so I can now deploy it. So if I come over here, come back over here and say kubectl apply. I got a kubectl apply too there, Ray. See, fan? I can do that. All right. Uh, target, Kubernetes, Kubernetes YAML. Let's see. Okay, there it goes, kubectl. And that's my service. That's my deployment. That's all my artifacts. So get deployments and kubectl get pods. It's coming to life. If I look at my little console here, there it is coming up. And there's my actively running pod. Yeah, that's pretty awesome, right? Yeah, cool. Well, I got one more thing for you, Ray. I got, yep. I got to show you something, OK? Uh, I was noticing your YAML over there. I got a chance to see what your image looks like. So I can do the kubectl apply-f thing and the YAML file, but I can also just hit this Add button and pick from a catalog, pick from Git, Docker file, et cetera, et cetera. But I'll pick your container image. Oh, let me see. If I remember it, it was GCRIO, right? I can go to that. Uh, Dev Nexus, uh, let's see if I type this correctly. Balloons, and it was configuration service, SB, and there was the latest tag on that. Let me see if I type that incorrectly. Yep, yep, fantastic. I can hit create, and I'm now pulling your image from your rep registry, your repository, into my cluster and running it over here. Check that out. So here it comes, coming in. And then I can also, let me, uh, I can also, I'll tell you what, this is actually a very cool thing about the declarative nature of Kubernetes. I can basically say, I want four of those, because we might have a lot of users today. I want to scale out. So check that out. What do you think, Ray? Ooh, I like the console a lot. I wish, I, I wish we have one. Actually, you know what? We do. Oh. Oh. Let, me, uh, let me go, uh, go back to my console here. So on GKE, we do have a console in the in, the paint, in our um, Google Cloud Platform console, and uh, I can see my namespace here. I have my configuration deployed, and let me go ahead and uh, click into it, and this is going to allow me to see some of the basic metrics about this container, and uh, I can go ahead and go to actions and scale. How many did you scale to, Burr? Four. four? Well, I can do the same thing. I'm gonna scale to four. I'm gonna let it wait and uh, run out, and then you deploy my container into your cluster. Well, I'm gonna deploy your container into mine. So I'm going to go to the console as well. Here I can do the refresh. And I'm going to go ahead and deploy. Okay. And the container image, I'm going to use your container image on Quay.io. And if I scroll down, I'm going to say done, continue. And I'm going to call this the configuration, configuration service uh, dash Q. Okay. And then uh, here I can also add labels. So in Kubernetes, you can label everything uh, however you want. So I'm going to add a label here called version. I'm going to call it Q as well. And I'm going to go ahead and deploy. And this will deploy your container into my cluster. Oh, wow. OK, OK. Pretty cool. Yeah. Now, another thing about Kubernetes that's really, really awesome, it's one of my favorite features, is that uh, because you're declaring the desired state, so when we said earlier that we wanted to have four instances of our application running, uh, it actually went ahead and scaled out to four instances. Now, if one of these instances actually goes away by whatever um, in the unfortunate event that was, uh, Kubernetes will try to restart it for you as well. So let me go ahead and uh, come back to the console. And uh, if I want to see all the instances running, I can see I got four instances of my Spring Boot backend. I got two, three instances of the, the Quarkus backend. And if, watch the visualizers uh, very closely. I'm going to go ahead and simulate a failure in one of these instances. I'm going to kill one of them. And uh, watch very quickly. One of them went away, and Kubernetes noticed it in the reconciliation loop and re restarted another instance almost immediately right after that. I actually love that feature of Kubernetes, automatic restarts based on the liveness probe, readiness probe, and how many people have been restarting JVMs throughout their life cycle in their career. Now we get automatic restarts. Isn't that awesome? And how many people restart your JVM every week? Today. <laughs> well, in Kubernetes, there is a little function called the cron tab, just so you know. But uh, don't use it to restart your JVMs, OK? OK, OK, right. Well, so I guess at this point, though, we need to kind of show you what we've been building and what we've been working on. And so let me kind of switch over here and show you what we have on my screen. And there we go. So this is the application we've deployed. We've already got it deployed. Uh, and we're going to be making some changes to it, show you how dynamic it is. But I want you to check this out, right? So here it is. You can kind of tell this is OpenShift on Google Cloud Platform. You can kind of see what the name that's generated. You just pop these balloons. It works like Fruit Ninja. 
You can kind of see this one right here is mine running on Amazon, okay? OpenShift running on Amazon, AWS there. All right, this one's OpenShift running on Azure. Okay, all that's running right there. And then, of course, we have the Google uh, Container Engine, right? GKE, right? That's Ray's cluster right there. So we have four clusters running for you guys, and we're going to have a lot of fun playing with it. And let me show you how uh, let me show you how dynamic it is. And I have some scripts right here. So if I can basically say make it into a hard to play game. So let me go switch over here. All right, and you can see the balloons get very small and very fast, right? When they get straight out there. So this is actually a very fun game. We can push server-side changes through a WebSocket and make changes in real time. If I want to make it easy, as an example, I can make the balloons big and fat and slow. All right? OK, so now you can really play this game very really rapidly. So it's actually going to be a very fun game, but I know Ray's got some more things to show you. we got some more stuff to tell you about. So Ray, what do you got? Right. So when I deployed that manifest, the YAML file, into my Kubernetes cluster, it was just a regular Kubernetes YAML, uh, YAML file, right? However, I have actually installed Istio in my cluster so that it automatically added Istio service mesh to my application as well. So I'm actually running my microservice in the service mesh. Well, what does that mean? Well, my Spring Boot application uh, basically had no additional metrics in there. I'm not using any uh, ex metrics exporter. But with Istio, we can automatically instrument your application. And we can know the request that's coming in and going out. And we know all the latency. We can know the request per second and its availability without you having to do any extra work on your application. And the way that this is done by using an Envoy sidecar behind the scenes, that's actually intercepting all the requests. And what that means is that in my cluster, I can actually go to my Grafana dashboard, which comes installed with a demo installation of Istio. And from here, you can actually explore the different uh, dashboard that we already created by default, OK? So all of the dashboard here uh, is actually there by default. And if we go into the Istio service dashboard, we can actually see the different services that's already there. And we can see the metrics associated with these service, too. So we can very clearly see that the config service is being hit by the game server to retrieve some configuration. And we can see the operation per second. We can see its availability, and we can see how long the average request actually took, right? That's pretty cool. Now, in addition to that, uh, based on this information, we can also show you another console here, which is Kiali. Now, Bert, didn't a Red Hat create Kiali as well? I know, yeah. We were a key contributor to Kiali to the upstream of Istio. Yeah. So in this case, uh, I'm using the Kiali, and one of my favorite graphs to show is the, the service graph here. So we can see very clearly that traffic was coming in from the gateway. And then I have the game client here. That's 100% that's of the requests coming in. And over here, I got the game server. And then the game server is actually talking to the config service. Right? So this observability is something that you get with the service mesh without you having to do a lot of work in your own application. Okay? And then one of the other features that I'm going to show is the ability to traffic shift. So what that means is that Right now, we have multiple versions of the applications uh, of the config service running behind the scenes. We have the default one, we got the, the Spring Boot one, and we got the Quarkus one, which we both deployed, right? So tell you what, Bert, I'm going to do a traffic shift from the default configuration to the Spring Boot version, OK? OK, yeah. And the way that we're going to do it is by updating the YAML file here. So all of the configuration here can be declared. So first, we have declared a destination rule. This allows us to figure out, OK, which versions do I actually have running the back end? And currently, I have different subsets, default, Spring Boot, and Quarkus. But you can name this whatever you want. It can be blue, green, v1, v2, v3, or whatever that suits your business application. Now down here, which is the important part, which is in the virtual service, in the virtual service here, we can actually determine how much traffic to send to each one of these different versions. So I'm going to shift traffic now from the default version to 100% to the Spring Boot version. And the way I'm going to do it is something like this. I'm going to open up the game as well. Let me see where's my game, which is running here. And this is my console. Yeah. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, apply this change as well. I'm going to apply this config traffic. Now watch very carefully. Right now, the blue and the background is, oh, so we just changed the background to blue. And the balloon got a little bigger, right? You can click on this a little bit, right? Oh, check it out. Wait, what was that? <laughs> I think that was what we called the golden snitch number two. And that was a ray balloon. The ray balloon? What's up with that? Oh, there we go. There we go. And if you click on the ray balloon, it's 100 point. Wow. Well, no, well Freddie, yeah. what do you think about that? Yeah, that was pretty cool, huh, Freddie? Yeah? 
Here we go. I'm going to play this game for now. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Another Ray Balloon. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty yeah. good. Yeah, you're getting ahead of the rest of us, man. That's not cool. Now, wait a second. Now, let me go back to the console as well. So in this PLE view with the service graph, right, we switch the traffic from one version to another. I'm going to go to the version app graph here. And we can see here that the game server is talking to the config service. And then we have the traffic shifting happening right now. And the, the, the metrics is a little stale. So very quickly, we're going to see all the traffic now is going to be going to the Spring Boot version rather than the default version. Wow. OK, that's pretty cool. What do you guys think? Yeah? There we go, 100%. OK, well, I like Istio also. And Istio is something I spent a lot of time on. As a matter of fact, I wrote a book on Istio. I have it out there. So I dig the Istio thing, but I got one more thing to show you, OK? I want to tell you about this technology called Knative. And with Knative, it's another technology you add to your cluster. And with that, uh, you can then make it a serverless architecture, right? And that, do I, yeah, I got Ray Balloons too. So it seems we got Ray Balloons. So let's kind of show you something about Knative. We don't have a lot of time in our session right now, but I'll just give you a quick little demonstration of Knative. Let me switch over to this, this user interface here. I'm going to just run a little Knative demo for you, kind of see what I mean. Right now, there are no pods running that are going to respond to this specific event. In this case, I'm going to flood this Kafka topic with a bunch of messages real fast. So Corolla localhost is just going to push a bunch of messages in. OK? And, and based on that, you're going to see pods start springing to life. Because what Knative does is it looks for traffic. It looks for activity, typically HTTP traffic, but in this case, Kafka traffic. And it starts to dynamically scale out the infrastructure based on demand. And you can see right now, it's actually going to try to get up to 100 pods. It's got 90 pending scheduled across my cluster right now. This is running on my Azure cluster in this particular case. And you can see it's going, going, trying to get out to that 100 pods. And of course, think about that for one second. We just, we're launching 100 application servers, application components, right? In my case, Quarkus-based applications compiled to native code in just a few seconds. We have 100 of them up right now. All right, that's actually pretty cool, right? What do you think, Nancy? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. OK. And what will happen with Knative, it'll see in the next 60 seconds or so that it doesn't actually need all this infrastructure to run this workload. I'm not sending any more traffic in. And it'll start automatically downscaling it. OK, so Knative has really cool features like that. And, but it has, it has one more cool feature uh, that I want to show you. And let's see if I can get this right. So there I am. I'm, I'm on my Azure cluster. I'll just make a change to my Azure cluster. So get that there, 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 there. Get that one up. Oh, I want this one up. Fantastic. OK. And let's see here. Here, here, here. Yeah, there we go. OK. Um, I need to basically cube CTL apply. I'm going to make a change here. Configuration. And we're going to go to the Quarkus configuration. And I'm going to show you what this file looks like. So you notice there's a bunch of YAML here, right? We always are doing YAML in our world. Uh, but if you look right here and kind of see carefully, basically Knative has a concept of traffic shifting as well. And it has it in a dynamic auto-scaling way. So in this case, that deployment, that Quarkus deployment was not even running. You can see it's going through its pod lifecycle, container creating after it pulls the image. And then, of course, it has to schedule it out across my cluster. Hopefully, there's still room in that cluster since I just ran 100 pods out there and they're downscaling. But there it goes. It's got my Quarkus configuration now active. And there, there's the burr balloon. Check what? that out. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I what? can score points by hitting my balloon now. What That's do you do with awesome. my balloon? What yeah. happened to mine? I know, I know. Oh, no, I know. Well, I, there's actually, we have a way to add you back. It's OK. All right. We, we can add you back. OK? But what do you think? Istio and Knative certainly extend the Kubernetes platform, the OpenShift platform, to give you all this amazing new capability. So I think it was cool that you guys got a chance to see that. And I'm glad Ray and I were able to show that to you. But now, we got to actually talk to you about one more little thing before we let you play. So you want to explain the load balancer? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, we can play by connecting to each one of these endpoints individually, right? They all have different IP addresses. But uh, what we decided to do is to put all of them behind a single load balancer. And the load balancer is now running Istio on the GCP server. And um, I actually can use the virtual service to also configure the destination to the slash game, which is the one that you're going to be receiving these balloons from, we can switch that and we can route it to different backends as well. So here we have the routing rules. So what we're going to do is to do a, you know, almost an even split, 33, 33, and 33. Well, you got to make 100, so I got to put 34 somewhere. And uh, here we can see that the destination is actually going to a different backend that's outside of my cluster, right? So this can be done uh, not just within your cluster, but also outside. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, Deploy this. I'm going to say apply. 
And uh, let me do the multi-cloud configuration here. Okay, so I apply all the changes. So if everything works, <laughs> if everything works, uh, we should be able to go to uh, kubejava.com, and you can probably go there too, and you can start the game, and we'll drop you in one of the backends uh, as well. And the way that you can tell is by seeing the text here. So you're, I'm currently on the GKE cluster. Uh, let me just make sure that if I open up a new window right here and uh, try to connect. And this is um, another cloud that starts with an A. <laughs> <laughs> and if I do it one more time, a few times here, uh, let me see here. So you guys get connected to our kubejava.com. Oh, there we go. And that'll load balance you over to one of our yeah. existing clusters. You know, you might, we'll yeah. And you might want to do uh, HTTPS on the uh, mobile side if uh, it doesn't let you connect to web sockets. Yeah, really? HTTPS, and that'll let you connect to the web socket. Yeah. And I'm, I have it running on my phone now, and you've got a bunch running right there. That's fantastic. Yeah. We'll let you guys actually play for a few seconds. You can just actually see how many transactions you can get in. I'm already up to 1,800 points. What, anyone got any good points oh, there yet? Oh, what? I need to uh, work harder here. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how, how many people are actually playing the game? How many people are able to connect? All right. right. Fantastic. Nice. Awesome. Very, very cool. Okay. All right, well, let's switch back over to my laptop. I got one more thing I want to talk to you about. You guys keep playing, though. You keep punching those things in. You guys are giving transactions to our back end, playing our game. We're kind of seeing how well it scales. You are a load test today. Did you guys know that? Okay. <laughs> All right. But actually, I need to show you one more thing. And that is, I need everyone, I need everyone's attention right now. So everybody needs to go ahead and stop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can we can freeze you all of you. We got you we got you covered, right? We got you covered. Now we gotta wrap this thing up. We've been going pretty hard. Hopefully you saw some really cool things. But we got one more thing I want to show you. Okay? We built an application, ran it across all these clusters, all these clouds, right? Ray was my partner here. We did some really cool things. But I want to show you something else. One little thing. I'm gonna come over here now and look this is my Amazon one running right now. What happens if I decide I'm moving from one cloud to another? That's the beautiful thing of building applications this way. I build them the uh, OpenShift way. If I decide I am no longer interested, and I'll just come over here and simulate that, I'm gonna just take Amazon down, okay? Let's do that. Uh, let's see over here. Let's just take it down and kill it, and the server is gone, right? And here's what's cool about that. You'll fail over to one of the clouds running our application architecture already right now, all right? So everybody can get going again. Let me actually run the game. And uh, dun, dun, dun. everybody goes back to play mode, right? There we go, and I can even look here. And there we go, so this one's back to playing. Again, you're back to playing. Okay, Ray, what yeah. do you think about that? Yeah, that's really, really cool. Yeah, 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 awesome. so with the failover, depending on if you go into our load balancer, you'll see that you can pick up a different cloud, and Amazon is no longer one of them, unfortunately. But there's my, there's one, I was on GKE, on Azure, there's GKE again, okay? And we can have a lot of fun with that. Okay, at this point, though, we need to be game over. We need okay. to shut it down, right? We got, we got to oh. finish this presentation and get this thing turned off. And let's see here. Let me check out one of these. All right, game over. Game over. All right, <laughs> fantastic. Yeah, 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 we shut it down. All right, and we changed that directly on your phone. Okay? <laughs> Woo! Well, that was a lot of fun, and we're wow. almost out of time here. So we just got tough. a few words to say in closing. Hopefully, you guys thought this was cool. Was this fun? All right. That was tough. That was, I've never done this before. Yeah. yeah so we, we took a big gamble here. We just basically said, can we run a complete live demo, back and forth presentation for a keynote? Forget the slide where let's just have some fun with this. Uh, I will kind of pop this back open though. I forgot to do that real quick. Right, 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 right there. Okay. So that are our holding slide. But um, first of all, thank you very much, Ray, for doing this and with uh, me. Thank you yeah. for having me here to yeah. uh, embark on this uh, crazy adventure. We we definitely had a lot of fun. Hopefully you guys thought it was super cool. What we need to do now though is get you guys out of here because we're gonna be wrapping up and heading out to our breakout sessions. But one thing I'll say though is if you'd like more information about Red Hat and what we do with OpenShift across all these clouds, come see us in the Red Hat booth. Or you can also come to my session later today for OpenShift where I'll do much of these same kinds of demonstrations and a whole lot more. And Ray? Yep, and uh, we also have a booth outside on the Google Cloud Lounge. And uh, come over here and uh, learn more about Google Cloud and the Anthos platform that can help you with your hybrid needs as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so hopefully you guys had fun. And you can see the power Java, of course, lets you write code and run it everywhere. And? For Kubernetes, uh, we actually allow you to write once and create a container image. And now you can run in different environments all the same way as well.
across the hybrid cloud. Right, thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much, Ray. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you.